Thank you for joining us. I'm Peter Bergen, uh, Vice President of New America. Very lucky to have Steve Cole, a former president of New America and also former dean of the Columbia Journalism School and a um, known to anybody in the national security, security community as uh, one of the great writers uh, on American national security. He's won uh, a Pulitzer Prize for Ghost Wars, of course, and has written extensively about Afghanistan, Pakistan, Exxon, uh, and now Iraq uh, in the Achilles Trap, Saddam Hussein, the CIA, and the origins of America's invasion of Iraq. So I'm turn it over to Steve, uh, who's going to give us uh, some of the uh, kind of main thesis points of the book, and then we'll uh, have Q&A. Um, if you have a question, there is an app, Slido, put the question in there. I will relay, relay those questions to, to Steve, and if you want to buy the book, there's a button on the right hand side of your screen to buy the book. Steve. Uh, thank you, Peter. And hello, everyone that I can't see, but I'm sure you're out there. It's uh, good to be here. I'm speaking from London. Um, I um, will just try to introduce the framing of this inquiry and a little bit of the methodology because it's unusual. And then some of the main kind of themes. It's a it's a complicated story. It can't be summarized in 15 or 20 minutes, but I'll, I'll try to lay a foundation for your questions and then respond to those. So, um, you know, we all uh, lived, probably everyone on this call lived through the trauma of um, the discovery after the invasion of Iraq in 2003 that the principal thesis of the war that Saddam retained dangerous weapons of mass destruction and needed to be disarmed that was based on false information about his WMD um, program. And of course, we had a national reckoning that lasted for years, politically polarized, and all sorts of inquiries about how we got from 9-11 to the decision to invade. And of course, that from a journalist perspective, that feels like well-traveled ground. A lot of great work has been done about it from many perspectives. But it always seemed to me, and I'll explain why in a minute, that there was another big question that had never really been addressed, which was, in addition to the American calculations um, that led to this kind of tragic war, um, why did Saddam Hussein uh, sacrifice his long reign in power, and ultimately his life, his son's lives, for the sake of weapons that he didn't possess? What was his calculation? What was he thinking? And it turned out that the question is answerable because Saddam tape recorded his leadership conversations as assiduously as Richard Nixon. Now, the history of these materials from a public researcher's perspective, at least, is a bit convoluted, and I'll spare you the full story. But um, I became aware of them uh, when I was working alongside Peter at New America, and Peter was uh, doing research on Al-Qaeda, and there was a center, the Conflict Record Records Research Center, that possessed interesting materials that had been collected from Afghanistan, I think primarily, but elsewhere, um, and about Al-Qaeda. And then I think through him, I, I heard of the existence of these Saddam materials, which were also being gradually released into this center, which was housed at NDU, National Defense University. Some years later, in 2018, I was uh, still harboring this question about the origins of the war from Saddam's perspective. And I went looking for these materials, thinking there might be a book in it. And I discovered that they'd been withdrawn and that the center had been closed. And there began a long journey to try to get a hold of these materials. Um, and the short version is that I collaborated with a nonprofit, the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, to file a Freedom of Information Act request with the Pentagon, which holds the materials, um, and ultimately filed a lawsuit uh, under FOIA, settled with the Justice Department, and got a big batch of the materials. I also received a big chunk from a PhD student at Princeton named Michael Brill, who's a sort of unofficial archivist of what of fragments, of substantial fragments of this archive. It's a shame that this isn't publicly available because there really isn't any sensitive information from a national security perspective in it. And it is enormously valuable because it is such a rare 
meticulously documented case study of a dictatorship and of a dictator's mind and thinking. In addition to the transcripts and the tapes, there are millions of pages of documents from his presidential office, from his intelligence services and other sectors. And scholars, when they were available, made you know, insightful use of sections of them, but there's still so much more work to do. In any event, I use these materials to try to unpack uh, through narrative uh, investigative history and interviews with surviving members of Saddam's regime and unpublished um, memoirs and or published memoirs in, in the Arab world from participants and in events, um, interviews on the American side, uh, some kind of answer to this to this basic question. And um, I had an early interview with Charles Dolfer, who was the uh, leader of the Iraq survey group during its, uh, you know, for the longest run, and, and the author supervised the publication of their seminal report. Um, and early on, I had originally thought I would start the book in, at Safwan, the ceasefire um, event that ended the Gulf War, which I attended as a Washington Post reporter. I flew up on a helicopter behind uh, General Schwarzkopf, and I have vivid memories of that sense of this being unfinished business and not really a surrender and something else, but quite vivid. And I thought, oh, that'd be a great place to start. And after a couple of hours with uh, Mr. Dolfer, I was persuaded that I really needed to go back further in time to understand this. And I started thinking, oh, that's more work. But then I kept reading and I realized uh, he was right. So the book opens in 1979 and it's critical, the 80s, because that was a period a collaboration, of course, uh, undeclared collaboration between the United States and Saddam Hussein. Uh, Saddam, of course, uh, needlessly started a war with Iran in September of 1980. And then in 1982, the Reagan administration, through satellite surveillance, uh, detected that um, Iranian forces were perilously close to being able to break through Iraqi lines and drive on Baghdad, overthrow Saddam Hussein, which was Ayatollah Khomeini's declared objective, hang him from the nearest lamppost, and then expand the already uh, troubling Iranian revolution into Shia-majority Iraq. And to prevent that, the administration dispatched a CIA officer named uh, Thomas Twetton to Baghdad, carrying uh, gifts, as he called them, satellite photographs of Iranian positions designed to equip Iraqi forces with the eyesight to prevent this breakthrough and this turning point in the war. And that began a long collaboration uh, that lasted till 1988. It wasn't acknowledged at the time. You know, the outlines of it have been known, but the details are fascinating to dig into. And I think I've brought some fresh uh, information and perspective to the record. The fascinating thing about it is to see this collaboration with the CIA from Saddam's point of view, because he was always suspicious about American motives. He saw the world through a, you know, a dark lens of conspiracies and particularly believed that his own position was under threat from a kind of permanent conspiracy involving the United States, Israel, uh, Zionism in general. He was a a horrible anti-Semite and, and you know explicit racist about uh, Judaism. And he saw uh, American and Israeli collaboration as extending to Ayatollah Khomeini. And he saw the Iranian revolution as essentially a, an American Zionist project. And he believed that this effort by the CIA to help him against Iran was suspect because Either these photos were doctored and designed to trap Iraqi forces, uh, or he, the Americans were providing the same pictures to the Iranians. And his generals essentially said, uh, you know, boss, you know, we can look over the mountain and the things that are in the photos are actually there and it's helpful. <laughs> so please keep the stuff coming. But at meetings, he was constantly kind of questioning the context. And then in November, 1986, um, comes an announcement in Washington of what we came to know as the Iran-Contra scandal. And of course, this was um, a misguided attempt by the Reagan administration to free hostages held in Lebanon by Iranian proxies by collaborating with Israel to supply arms to Ayatollah Khomeini's regime. And the announcement of this 
scandal as it became criminal cases eventually because it involved uh, a front in Nicaragua. That's not important to our story. Um, but when it was announced, it shocked Washington. There's like a banner headline in the New York Times the next day. People start resigning, prosecutors start mobilizing, and all around the Arab world, allies, Arab Sunni allies, are stunned that the United States would have done something like this to empower Iran. Well, we have the tapes, and the next morning over the next week, the least surprised leader in the entire world, Saddam Hussein, <laughs> gathers with his colleagues and says, I told you so. You know, I think there's literally one quote where he says, Zionism, Zionism, how many times do I have to say this? It's what, yeah. So anyway, um, what's interesting over time is that his satisfaction in being confirmed in his beliefs about the enemies arrayed against him uh, stayed with him into the 90s. And there are other tapes when he's discussing his choices about cooperation or non-cooperation with the US or with the UN inspection regime. And he refers back to the 80s. He more or less says, you know, the, the things that were revealed in November 1986, remember, friends, that is still the way the world is organized. Um, and so the narrative uh, follows uh, these developments. It tracks the sort of inside story of the Iraqi nuclear program through the character of its Robert Oppen Oppenheimer, uh, Jafar Dia Jafar, who I had the uh, opportunity to interview in uh, Dubai, still alive in his 80s, sharp as a tack, uh, like a lot of theoretical physicists, slightly intimidating in conversation, but we uh, we connected. I'd at least covered nuclear weapons before, so wasn't completely a fool. And um, then we opened a correspondence that informed the book, I think, quite richly over the course of that side of the story. And, uh, and then into the 90s, and we can talk about this in the Q and A, but the um, the sort of mirroring of misunderstandings that developed during the inspection era, um, you know, of course, after the invasion of of Kuwait and the expulsion of Iraqi forces by the coalition led by the United States in 1991, what we know now is that Saddam did something that's very hard to explain, which is in the summer of 1991. He destroyed much of his inventory of WMD, chemical weapons, prohibited missiles, um, tried to cover up or dismantle aspects of his dual use industries that supported biological weapons and nuclear weapons, his, his substantial indigenous nuclear weapons program, which Jafar had overseen during the 80s and had, which had gone undetected until then. It was also another shock that the world had to absorb that summer. He, so he he ordered his son-in-law to get, to basically get rid of it as much as he physically could, hide it or destroy it, destroyed a lot of stocks, kept no records, took no photographs, did it chaotically. You almost have this image of uh, his son-in-law, Hussein Kamal, out in the desert in the dark of night, you know, pouring vats into the sand randomly without any record keeping. And then he misled inspectors for, you know, for years about the history of the programs, about what he had done. He didn't come clean to his own generals about what he had actually done. Now, why did he handle his disarmament this way? I mean, there isn't really a fully satisfactory answer, but um, partly he was hoping to wriggle out of sanctions. That was his principal goal. Uh, that would help him maintain power and give him options um, in the region. And he thought that he needed to pass inspections in order to have a chance to wriggle out of sanctions. So he wanted not to have a lot of stuff lying around that inspectors could find. So that's why I think that was his principal uh, reason for ordering his son-in-law to do this. Um, in passing inspections, his theory of the case was that he would do well enough, they wouldn't find stuff, and then maybe the French and the Soviets, the Russians would help him out. Um, I think also, um, while he was inclined to trade disarmament for sanctions relief, um, he wasn't willing to be humiliated in public. And so the kind of transparent disarmament that was required, you know, this sort of image of men in white coats and clipboards standing systematically and watching the destruction of everything that he had built 
um, just was unacceptable to him and he wasn't going to do it. He'd rather go down in flames than be humiliated in front of the Arab world and, and the wider world. And, uh, and so, um, so he did this and sowed seeds of confusion. Uh, and then uh, the inspectors, uh, understandably confused about what was believable and what wasn't, um, and determined to try to carry out their mission to find the truth, um, intensified their, their inspection methods and increasingly targeted the top of the regime, thinking that his bodyguard, essentially the special security organization, was the answer to the question of where was this stuff. And the more they targeted his uh, security apparatus, uh, the more his security apparatus reacted defensively and created the impression that they were hiding something and they were hiding something, but it wasn't WMD. They were hiding state secrets. They were hiding, they were trying to protect the president's security. He was of course paranoid and for some reason. Anyway, that takes you through the nineties. And I'll, the last section of the book covers the period from 9-11 to 2003. And I've tried not to repeat the narrative uh, that is familiar to us in the US, although some of it is necessary to include, but to try to offer Saddam's perspective. And I don't have time to go into all of it. I hope you'll read it. It's, it's my favorite part of the book, even though in some ways that period is familiar, the Saddam side of the story is not. I mean, one element of it is that we didn't understand that in his 60s, which he had now reached his 60s, he's still vigorous, um, he, had, he wasn't quite the same person as he had been. Um, he had become obsessed with writing novels. He took much less interest, probably to the re relief of his generals in military affairs. He was kind of a micromanager and entirely incompetent about military matters, even though he considered himself uh, a successful general. But he, he was spending a lot of time handwriting novels. He wrote four in the period of several years there leading up to 2003. The last one, he just barely got to the printer as the tanks rolled towards Baghdad. And I talked to one of his editors um, who uh, you know, recalled that when he first started sending over these longhand Arabic pages, um, they would tell him that, I mean, he would say, would you correct my Arabic? Uh, you know, send back notes. And they took him seriously. And they said, you know, he wrote like he spoke, he, these long meandering sentences with a lot of digressions and parentheticals. And so they would try to kind of break it up and make it more readable. And uh, then they noticed that he would not take any of their suggestions. <laughs> they would just turn it back the way he wrote it. And they, after three or four times, they just thought, you know what, maybe it would be safer not to correct him at all. And so they just started sending them back the way they were handed to him. And, and anyway, this was the kind of life that he was living in a period of greater isolation, um, greater paranoia, fewer public appearances. And we have now, through these uh, records that came out through the FOIA suit, pretty good, uh, almost week by week, between my files and Michael's files, we have a pretty good week by week account of his cabinet meetings, what he was saying, meetings with visitors. He was completely oblivious to being in the crosshairs uh, in the fall of 2001. He was still oblivious throughout 2002. It was really only in 2003 that he started to get it. And that's part of the reason why he was so ill-prepared when the invasion actually occurred. But why don't I stop there, Peter, and uh, sure. we'll take questions. A few questions for me and then we'll turn to the audience. So the conflict records research center that you mentioned, I mean, my understanding is the budget for that place was like a million dollars, which is not even around yes. the Pentagon. And uh, why it closed is sort of a puzzle. It is a puzzle. I, I, I mean, there is a, you know, there is an official explanation which has to do with budgetary reasons. I, there was, I don't remember the chronology of all of these, uh, you know, debt default, crises and and sequ budget sequesters that followed these kind of automatic cuts that were agreed during the late Obama administration under pressure from Congress over fiscal issues. But in one of those cycles, DOD supposedly decided, looking for haircuts everywhere, that this was something that they could no longer afford. And that's why it fell by the wayside. The, the materials were withdrawn. They were digitized. Um, they were withdrawn and they were held, still are held on a hard drive in a particular part of the Pentagon. Uh, 
which I was able to identify, which at least made it easy to file a FOIA suit. Um, I don't know whether that is the full explanation. It is a puzzle. I mean, there are other sensitivities around the records. They um, uh, they contain a lot of personally identifiable information um, that, in the context of sectarian violence in the in the you know 2015 period, um, could make people vulnerable. However. Um, the Conflict Records Research Center, like many other academic repositories of such records, had methodologies for making sure that PII of non-public people wasn't disclosed. And I can't, I can't believe that was really the reason. Um, yeah, it's it, it's a bit of a puzzle. And zooming out, I mean, it's interesting to me. You know, you're sitting in London, and the Shilcott inquiry generated, I think, six thousand pages of uh, investigation into, led by in part by Sir Lawrence Friedman. Um, it's, uh, I think, two million words. <laughs> um, hmm. Obviously, a very thorough accounting. And the British, at the end of the day, were, you know, they weren't the main event in the Iraq War. And we in the United States have had really no. Uh, official inquiry. We've had fragments, and all, and your book obviously is going to be a big part of the actual history. And um, current New America fellow Joel Rabin was the lead pen on the U.S. Army history of Iraq, which is a very thorough accounting, but obviously by its nature couldn't get into much into the politics or the intelligence, relatively speaking. So, I mean, it, it's kind of, it's sort of strange that, that probably the most important event in American history uh, since uh, since 9-11 sort of remains underexplored. I mean, your book will go a long way to help. Uh, but, you know, why is it that we haven't had that reckoning? Politics, I guess. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, there were some initial inquiries. They were all constrained. There was the Senate intelligence inquiry, but I think um, it wasn't in the end, a bipartisan effort fully. Uh, it, it does put a lot of information on the record about the specific analytical kind of chronology inside the IC, making calls about WMD that were wrong, but it's a, it's a slice of the pie. There was the commission that was specifically charged with identifying the way forward and not really excavating the past. You mentioned Chilcot. I mean, uh, with, uh, a couple, with a graduate student um, at Columbia, I went through all of it, uh, looking for insights, fresh insights um, relevant to the chronology I was trying to unpack. And there were a lot about America. What was so powerful about Chilcot from an American historian's perspective is journalist perspective is that, you know, the Brits had access to all quarters of the Bush administration between 9-11 and 2003, and they sent people into meetings at very interesting times with principals, Condoleezza Rice, they had a lot of access to Colin Powell, they went to the Pentagon, and of course, these folks wrote memoranda of conversations, just capturing what was said, and they wrote analytical cables back to their own government saying, it looks like they're going this way, or here's here's the divide. With And there is a lot, to my eyes, a lot of um, interesting, fresh information about exactly when the Bush administration decided on X and Y, and what the tenor was within the administration down the stretch there as they were trying to get that second resolution. I just... It's very painful to read uh, because you know that car crashes at the end, but um, it's quite a quite an important record from an American perspective. Um, I I don't imagine at this point that any inquiry on the U.S. side will bring forward comparable documents. We're going to have to wait for declassification um, and for yeah for the U.S. archival system to get its act together. And of course, the conclusion of the uh, army history of, of, of the Iraq war is that the sole winner was Iran, uh, which goes to many of the themes of your book. Um, and in a sense, it explains you know, a lot about it's sort of the original sin that explains much that is going on today. So, I mean, take us back to the to the 80s. And you, you mentioned this a little bit, but I mean, Saddam must have felt pretty good about um, 
you know, the, he, in his own mind, he must have felt, you know, the Americans really need me because at the end of the day, they just like the Iranians a lot more than they dislike me. I mean, that was the basic kind of, was that his basic thinking? Yeah, I don't think he, yes. I mean, he felt that the Gulf um, Arabs really needed him and that they were American allies and that would be one basis for him having a correct relationship with the United States. What he really wanted was, like a lot of middle powers, he wanted not to have an unbalanced relationship with the superpowers. So during the Cold War, he wanted, he had relations with Moscow you know, that were historical, that involved arms supplies and other relations. He, I think, even visited Russia perhaps twice. Uh, he never visited the United States. Uh, the only European country he ever visited uh, is France, uh, and, well, maybe Yugoslavia. If you, um, but in any event, um, he wanted balanced relations with the United States, and Iran was important in that equation. But his principal way of thinking about um, his interests and America's ran through the through the Gulf, and he regarded the Gulf Arabs, you know, the Saudi royal family, the Kuwaiti royal family, the UAE, as with some contempt. the The tapes are kind of unsparing. I think the feeling was mutual, uh, but in any event, uh, we have his tapes, and uh, he's constantly denigrating them because he felt, not without justification, that he was sort of their mercenary force during the '80s as he fought Iran to a standstill. They funded him and his people fought and died. Now, he thought that he was seeking and attaining glory in the Arab world, so good for him. But when it was over, uh, he felt some resentment. And he also thought that they were clients of the United States in some way that that was problematic from his perspective. He didn't want the U.S. policing shipping in the Gulf or the oil economy that was flowing through the Gulf. And so it was complicated in that way. But yes... He wanted balanced relations with the United States. And at the peak of the collaboration, sort of, you know, late Reagan, early Bush, H.W. Bush, you know, a lot of commerce was flowing and visitors uh, from Donald Rumsfeld through uh, mid-level State Department folks would come and see him. Senators, uh, a, a delegation led by Bob Dole visited him in early 1990. And, you, and every time the Americans come into his office, he sort of takes them over to the window and says, you see those skyscrapers on the Baghdad horizon? You know, French contractors built those and French architects. I'd love to have more Americans here. And so the business was was real then. And commerce was a motivation for accommodating Saddam, uh, both in London and Washington in the late 80s, even though he was gassing uh, his own Kurdish population more or less in plain sight. And people were overlooking it because it seemed like maybe this was going to be a stable relationship, which it didn't turn out to be. So a comment from the audience, uh, this is from Ambassador John Negroponte. We cooperated with Iraq beyond intelligence. I chaired the deputies committee at the NSC in 1988 when we approved CCC loans for Iraqi purchase of US agricultural products. Yeah, exactly. That was the kind of peak peak cooperation. And there was this, this um, this Italian bank with an Atlanta branch that somehow hijacked the credit scheme and committed that, some massive fraud. I forget. Was it BNL or something? BNL, else? yes. Yeah. It was yeah. one of those stories that if you weren't assigned to it as a Washington Post reporter, you were grateful <laughs> because it just seemed like a giant headache. But but the net effect was that it goosed, uh, you know, improperly goosed this program that was already designed to to um encourage agricultural exports, uh, which would benefit the US and Iraq. And then there were other streams of commerce. There were some restricted lists, but um, it was, you know, the idea was to lean forward. Speaking of uh, the Washington Post, you of course were managing editor at a rather key moment in all this. And I remember when Joby Rorick wrote that big piece about basically he'd been embedded with the inspectors and they weren't finding anything. And it was like, yeah. it was so shocking. I mean, so what was, yeah. you were you were the managing editor of the Post, and what was the reaction to that story and your involvement, and uh, were you surprised, or were you, you kind of saw this one coming, or? I mean, yeah, I tried to be clinical about all these things, like, you know, what exactly do we know, what do we not know, and try not to get caught up in the emotions or the politics of these. It's hard to do that job if you're going to, you know, try to forecast the future or, or think about it in political terms but it so the clinical response is what the 
heck, uh, you know, how, how did that happen? And uh, and so, and one of the first questions on my mind, well, well then what, 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 what was Saddam thinking? And in fact, in October, 2003, I traveled to Baghdad uh, on a reporting trip, even though I was an editor, I could resign myself to do things in the field. And, um, and I went out there and I met um, David Kay, who was the first uh, Iraq survey group leader. And, uh, and I met some of his scientists who were on the investigative team, and they had been dispatched, of course, to find the weapons. And But by October, uh, it was clear that there weren't any likely to be found, um, not definitive, but the trend line was kind of... Uh, hard to hard to ignore and so they were pivoting from where are the weapons to why are there not any weapons and they were starting to interview detainees and volunteers from the former regime about kind of what was the intellectual history of this program and that program and what was Saddam saying and thinking and I remember uh and I quote him I I saw this in an old Washington Post story and I used it in the introduction to the book in fact I just met him again in London he's still um still with us, uh, a British scientist who was on the team, a specialist in biological weapons. And I met him in Baghdad. And he he said something to the effect of, he, Saddam was then still at large. He's sort of speaking to him, tilting his eyes toward the sky, talking to an imaginary Saddam, like, what were you thinking? What, what was so important that you had to put us through all of this? <laughs> and uh, and at the time, David Kay's answer was, well, he was bluffing. It was a straightforward bluff. He was trying to deter Iran. That seemed like an appealing proposition. It's not all wrong, but I think now you can see the complexity of it. And it's a little too simple to say that he was just trying to preserve himself in power. Um, he did not want to show weakness, and Iran was one factor in that. Question for Michael Brill, who you mentioned uh, was uh, very helpful in terms of the, the, some of the archives that you used in the book. Uh, Brill's question is really about the, something that you dig into quite a lot in the book, which is the George H.W. assassination plot in Kuwait, which for a long time was believed to be um, the real deal. But you found what? Well, I found reason to be doubtful that it was the real deal. I can't close the case, unfortunately, you know, as a... Um, I think I want to be true to the evidence, but I I think if I were a juror and the and it was a you know preponderance of the evidence um, standard, no question, I would say it didn't happen. Um, if it was beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, I have to have to deliberate a little bit. But essentially, uh, the short version is uh, you'll recall that George H. W. Bush, after he was president in early. 1993, visited Kuwait at the invitation of the emir to be celebrated for liberating the country and restoring the family's sovereignty. And he traveled with uh, his son, Jeb, and other cabinet officials. I think Laura Bush was on the trip. George W. was not. Uh, they were feted at a great banquet. He gave some talks around Kuwait City, and they departed after several days. And without incident, nothing happened. Something like a week later, the Kuwaitis announced that they had foiled an assassination plot against him during his visit. And the principal evidence they cited was a vehicle bomb, an SUV bomb that they discovered, said they discovered in a warehouse in Kuwait City. And they said it had been built by Iraqi intelligence and dispatched to blow up HW. Now, the vehicle bomb was clearly a product of Iraqi intelligence. I think the evidence is clear about that. Um, but whether it was dispatched to Kuwait City to blow up HW is another matter altogether, because such bombs were discovered in Iraqi embassies around the Gulf, uh, and they had been placed there in the run-up to the Kuwait War by Iraqi intelligence and planning to use unconventional tactics, and maybe just because they like to have vehicle bombs in their embassies along with their, their weapons caches. And so, you know, is it possible, is it likely that this warehouse uh, bomb was placed there during the occupation of Kuwait and not dispatched to uh, specifically attack George H.W. Bush? Okay, so that's one question. Well, the answer to that from the Kuwaitis was, well, we found the assassins. And these were some hapless Iraqi whiskey smugglers who had been arrested and then confessed 
to having been dispatched by Iraqi intelligence to find the vehicle bomb in the warehouse and then drive it and blow up HW. Well, they were the worst. This was not day of the condor. You know, they, these guys had no idea what they were doing. And the whole thing just, the whole stories they told just didn't really add up. So Sandy Berger, uh, who was then Deputy National Security Advisor, his lawyer, kind of reacted the way I'm reacting now. Come on, this is not real. This is a this is a clever effort by the Kuwaitis to further discredit Saddam Hussein in the eyes of the world. And he didn't want to retaliate. Eventually, President Clinton decided that he would, though in a very limited way. Fast forward to the new information. So I have what I have. There's no reference really uh, to the assassination. There's one conversation in Berzano to Creedy's memoir that references it, but it's not dispositive. But um, having talked to others uh, who had access to the full Harmony records, um, you know, they did word searches because they were, they thought that would be a real scoop from this material. Like, let's find the documents where he orders the assassination. And they did all kinds of searches to try to find any reference to such a plot in, not just in Saddam's uh, presidential office, but in the intelligence files that they had. Not a thing. Um, now, you can't prove a negative, um, as which is sort of the story of the WMD <laughs> disaster. Right. So, you know, I could be wrong, uh, to, to be sure, but um, just telling you as a, uh, my vote on a preponderance standard would be it didn't happen. I mean, that was part of the issue about the invasion, of course, is that the only way you could prove uh, that anything was to invade the country. At I mean, that was the sort yes. of... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so this is a question from David Thurman, who helped put this uh, uh, event together. Did Saddam's thinkings and decisions around his WMD program and its dismantlement shape how he perceived reports regarding the w uh, WMD efforts of other states in the region? Can you can you re can re well, so restate I think, that? So, so, so I mean, the Saddam's experience of you know, having a WMD program and then dismantling it, did, did that affect the way that he sort of saw, I mean, what the Iranians were doing with their program or? Yeah, I mean, there was this funny line that I that, that I had forgotten from encountering David Kay um, in 2003. And he quoted, I think it was Tarek Aziz as saying that Saddam had told him, don't worry about the Iranians if they ever get WMD, the Americans and the Israelis will destroy them, <laughs> which was kind of, kind of you know, classic Saddam, slightly uh, half joking, but kind of prescient. Um, and so um, he thought about the region primarily uh, in reference to Israel, and he primarily saw Israel's uh, nuclear deterrent as something that the Arab world needed to match and that he was going to do that on behalf of the Arab world. In fact, there's one line, I don't remember if it's in a private recording or in a kind of remarks that he was making to other leaders, when he, he sort of says, uh, you know, the West ought to actually give us a nuclear weapon to create Cold War style deterrence uh, with the Israelis, and that will um, make conventional war less likely, just as it has in Europe, you know, not insane, except for the part about the West giving the Arab <laughs> world a nuclear weapon. But the point is that when he talked about why he wanted a weapon, um, you know, it was always, uh, he did understand the framework of mutually assured destruction deterrence between the United States and Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War. He thought that deterrence worked pretty much. And he thought that it could actually be stabilizing. He certainly thought that it would protect his own regime's survival. Um, and so that kind of deterrence he wanted as well. But there's no real record in reference to nuclear. Well, yeah, I guess you'd say there's, there's he doesn't talk rashly about preemptive use of nuclear weapons. He, he just wants to match Israel's capabilities so that they won't consider attacking him. Other sort of broader lessons uh, that we can apply today um, you know, obviously, Iran, we haven't had diplomatic relations since 79. We have very little understanding of what Kim Jong-un is thinking, except his public statements. I mean, are there larger lessons to be drawn about the intelligence community and uh, policymakers 
with um, these kind of very opaque regimes? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm a journalist, historian, I, I'm not a practitioner, but I can kind of empathize with the position of practitioners I, a little bit. And I guess um, my thinking about that is, you know, perhaps shaped by my experience as a journalist, but I don't, I, I think that the absence of contact between the United States and Iraq between 1991 and 2003 was it was unhelpful. Uh, would contact have changed the course of events? Hard to say, but as a journalist, I've learned that all information is good information. Um, you have to work with unreliable sources. You have to work with difficult sources. You have to talk to everybody. You have to talk to people you don't like. Um, Otherwise, you're not going to understand what's really going on. You're not going to have your best chance to understand what's really going on. And so then why um, are these, um, you know, why are these uh, conversations so difficult to have? I understand. Thank you, sweetie. <laughs> uh, sorry for that intervention. <laughs> Highly professional. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, um you know, domestic politics doesn't generally reward, um, you know, sort of conversations with adversaries. So it's, uh, domestic politics kind of tends to reinforce narratives of demonization and confrontation, toughness. And of course, sometimes that's necessary for deterrence. And um, But I'm not talking about presidents picking up the phone, talking to their counterparts or going off to Singapore to meet uh, Kim Jong Un for no no apparent reason necessarily, but we didn't even have secret intelligence channels. We didn't have diplomatic channels. There are professionals out there who are willing to to do the work. Um, there's always an agenda to discuss, um, and even if you know or have a very high degree of conviction that nothing productive is going to come from those contacts, you're still going to collect information you wouldn't otherwise have. Um, and relationships can be established in the intelligence business. These are recruiting opportunities. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons to maintain contact. And I just, and you know, the, 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 it's not just domestic politics that makes it difficult, but also our reliance, very heavy reliance on sanctions regimes, it seems to me, because we're in the Iraq case, the main reason uh, why we didn't develop channels, even though Iraq was anxious to open them, uh, was because we were afraid we would weaken the coalition that was carrying out the very tough multilateral sanctions that the UN Security Council had approved. And, you know, in fairness, if if the U.S. is seen as having regular conversations, engagement with a sanctions target, and France or many other countries who are partially cooperating with sanctions only because of U.S. pressure, they see that and then that gives them an out, you know, so, well, you know, you're engaging, well, we're going to take an independent course and, and break sanctions. And so I can see why that incentive discourages it. But to me, the cost benefit equation there doesn't make sense. Uh, you would, you're going to be much better off making smart decisions to defend American interests and national security. If you have the kind of information that uh, good channels, back channels can, can deliver. What was, um, this is a question from Jay, what was Saddam's view of bin Laden? I thought he was a, a fanatic and, um, you know, he didn't have anything to do with him. He, in the tapes after 9-11, he refers to Al-Qaeda only in passing, I um, mean, in the, in the notes of conversations with visitors. And, you know, and basically his thinking is that because he is opposed to such radical Islamists and is a stalwart against the Shia version of such radicalism in Iran, that the Americans will understand that this is actually a common interest. And, you know, this, the United States, we know, did reach out to Ba'athist Syria after 9-11 to seek cooperation against, um, you know, Al-Qaeda types. Um, and I think Saddam uh, was aware of that and thought that he might be next in line to to get that kind of cooperation. Um, and yeah, so he he's very dismissive of the fanatics, um, as he 
more or less uh, typically refers to them. And Saddam never visited the United States, and um, bin Laden, it, it, yeah, it, it, the one visit he had was pretty brief. Um, yeah. Both of them seem to share, a, in, in different ways, a, a complete misunderstanding of the United States. Yeah, I mean, Saddam's principal misunderstanding of the United States resulted from his anti-Semitism and his acceptance of the most hoary, you know, sort of uh, theories about Zionist influence in Washington, Zionist lobby. You know, all presidents are not independent architects of foreign policy. They just do what the Zionists tell them. Um, he mocks uh, Bill Clinton at Rabin's funeral, which he seems to be watching live on satellite TV for wearing a yarmulke. And he's He's just awful, and he really sees things so narrowly, and and it deprives him of his general shrewdness about power. So he is quite savvy about the way power is used, the way it balances, um, the way countries coerce and resist coercion. He can be quite shrewd, but about this he this is the, the, the this was his principal confusion about the united states he can be kind of amusing when he's trying to figure out american democratic politics on these tapes because <laughs> you know he, there's one meeting where where george w bush is elected in 2000 and, and he comes in he says comrades very exciting well it's a, it's very clear the the theme of the day is the bushes are back and what does that mean it's good for oil business and then he starts talking about the relationship between the family and the oil business and so forth but yeah, he's kind of like a CNN watcher. You can start to feel he is. I mean, I think he was watching a lot of satellite television and he was, he did get all of the international press sent to him in translation every day. He was a very hard worker. Um, we don't have an exact record of what he read and watched, but I think he's very, very much a news consumer by the time you get to the satellite TV age. And uh, yeah, so he's commenting on things. He gets confused. He gets confused about like Monica Lewinsky. What is that about? I don't really understand. Um, there must be some story behind the story. It can't be what it seems. Um, he gets confused about the relationship between Congress and the president. He's always asking his people like, can Congress really stop the president from doing things? <laughs> like, uh, yes, sir. It does. It's well, it's complicated. <laughs> Uh, he gets um, all this strain, yeah. So anyway, there's a question here from John McAuliffe. Um, what was the what was the role of mass protests in the U.S. against the Iraqi invasion? Was it obviously it was it was not preventative, but was it constraining? I think it's interesting. Yes, uh, when you look back at um, the record that I was referring to earlier from Chilcott, and you see the sort of specificity of the conversations between, um, you know, British national security advisors, uh, their national security advisor, David Manning and Condoleezza Rice and other conversations at the highest levels of the Bush administration in the winter of 2002 and 2003. One theme that recurs, of course, you know, Blair is in jeopardy politically at home because the street protests in Britain are an undeniable factor that constrain him. And he's worried about, he knows he needs a vote of, uh, on the war in parliament. He's wor worried about winning it. There's a lot of previously well-documented conversations between George W. Bush and Blair, in which Bush says, look, I don't want your government to fall over this war. I'd rather go to war without you than have your government fall over it. And Blair says, don't worry. I appreciate that, but I'm hanging in there. I think I can get there. This is part of why there's such an emphasis on strategic communication on selling the war, because Blair needs it. And then at a certain point, there's a big controversy inside the Bush administration around Christmas 2002 over whether to go back to the UN for a second resolution. And famously, Vice President Cheney is opposed to that, thinks we've already wasted enough time, and that the legalities of a second resolution, um, because the first one wasn't explicit enough about war authorization, just don't matter to the United States, but they do matter to Blair. And Blair makes it absolutely clear, I can't do this unless I get a second resolution, or at least that's what my people are telling me. And over Christmas, Condoleezza Rice, I don't, we don't know kind of why she comes to this conclusion, but presumably it's George W. Bush's call. She comes back in January and tells the Brits, okay, we've decided, we agree with you, but for our own reasons, and this is answering the question, 
we think we haven't brought the public far enough along yet in explaining why this is necessary. And we think that the UN process will help us with that and that the credibility of a second resolution will strengthen our position. Now, did she really believe that? I mean, I take her at face value, but you know, the public opinion polling in support of going after Saddam was pretty robust at that point. I think something like 75% of the American people seemed to believe that Saddam was responsible for 9-11 or had something to do with 9-11. And in any event, um, you know, Congress was not um, standing in the middle of the road. There was some politics. But anyway, that's what she said. And I found that quite striking. And I thought, okay, so, you know, maybe the, the Bush administration was nervous. And they there's no reference to street protests to be direct about the question. There's no reference to feeling constrained by American uh, kind of restive popular opinion or people taking to the streets. But there was a sense that the politics around the invasion was unfinished business and that they needed to work harder on it. This is from Anonymous. Uh, what about Saddam's conversations with the FBI agent when he was in captivity? That FBI agent, of course, is George Pirro, who spent several months with Saddam uh, for many hours at a time. Um, what what light did yeah, there are two. There, are, yeah, there are two records. You can. I, mean, I read all of those. They're they're interesting. I'll tell. I mean, they, and there's also um, John Nixon, a CIA leadership analyst, I believe, who had access to Saddam during this time. Wrote a very useful memoir about it. I found his memoir slightly more useful than the FBI transcripts, but they're both valuable. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, you have to set it in the context of the time. So it's, he's captured the end of 2003. These conversations take place in the first year or so um, of his captivity. He's adjusting to the fact that he has, that he's now a prisoner of war, that he's headed toward the gallows. Um, he's taking it all rather calmly. Um, and he's, you know, he seems like very, from, you know, if you've been, if he's been in your head, as he was in mine for years, um, and you're familiar with his voice and his attitude from the tapes when he was in power, there isn't really a shift in his voicing and his attitude and his kind of conduct in these interviews. He's, you know, he's full of pride, and there are some subjects that he just won't talk about, or he'll deflect, or he'll just be kind of uh, cross about the questioning. And then there are other areas where he'll he'll go on and on if you ask him. Um, so if you ask him about periods of history in in his own uh, kind of rise to power or his conduct of Iraqi foreign affairs, he he can be expansive. He doesn't make any more coherent, consistent sense in these interviews than he does on the tapes. But sometimes he can say things that are interesting. Um, but if you ask him about WMD or you know, his support for terrorism or things like that. And he'll just, you know, he'll just turn away. And so it's a mixed picture. I think the the earlier records when he was in power, I found to be, you know, much more interesting. Though you know, They have to be taken like all recordings with a grain of salt. I mean, one thing that you can clearly see in these meetings is that it's a performance for him. You know, he's got a captive audience, literally his cabinet, <laughs> his <laughs> revolutionary command council, like nobody ever interrupts him um, except to say, yes, well, great point, boss. Um, and so he, he rambles on a lot. But some of the time he's, he's speech making because he's recording in part so that his propagandists can capture his wisdom and put it on the front page of state newspapers, put it on the nightly broadcast and so forth. So these are not all, these are not typically um, loose conversations. Like the Nixon tapes have this air of like the people in the room don't even remember they're being recorded. So they're just, mm -hmm. they're being quite authentic, sometimes shockingly so. There are moments like that with Saddam, but they're usually under extreme pressure uh, so that some of the tapes during the Gulf War and before the Gulf War, have that more that kind of fractured, real conversation feel about them. But some of the rest is, you know, you understand, like he knows he's on a stage. Is um this is a question from Jay? Is any of Saddam's immediate family still alive? And where are they? What are they doing currently? If they are with, still with us? Yeah, he has daughters uh, who are alive in Jordan. Um, some of them have social media feeds uh, that 
you, know, you can you can follow. I haven't checked in on their social media feeds in the last you know nine months, but last I looked, they were um, you know they had vivid lives in Jordan. They didn't seem to be living in poverty. Um, and um, then there's a there's always been a rumor that he had a son by his um, mistress stroke second wife. Um, and that he somehow slipped the radar and um, you know migrated someplace and maybe alive and well he certainly would be of an age to be um, in late midlife um, but I have no information about whether that is true. Another question from the audience: Could Saddam speak, understand English, or any other language besides Arabic? Uh, his English wasn't terrible. Um, I think like a lot of English um, learners who never lived in an environment where they had to speak it every day, he understood um, English better than he spoke it. But he would drop uh, English phrases uh, into his conversations with, uh, you know, his post-war interlocutors, for example. And just in the final three minutes we have left, Steve, I mean, you, you obviously, you knew the story pretty well before you started. Right. I mean, you sort of lived it uh, as the managing editor of the Washington Post. But what was the kind of surprise as you went through this 2000 hours of of audio and you know millions of pages of documents and all of the, all these resources? What was the main surprise that you had? Well, I mean, I really I mean, I the main it wasn't a surprise, but I I discovered, as I would have guessed, that I really didn't understand the story at all, um, and that there was uh, far more kind of complexity to Saddam's rule than than I appreciated. Um, that he ruled through terror, yes, um, but also through you know patronage and and gifts, and that he was um, you know he maintained a lot of stable relationships in his life. He was not crazy. Uh, he was cruel, and he had grown up in very hard circumstances. He came of age as a political assassin. He committed murder, I think, you know, certainly before his 21st birthday. So, um, you know, not your a typical political leader, but, um, but he managed uh, his dictatorship with, um, you know, real kind of nuance in an odd way. And I found that, um, helpful to me as a writer because it gave me something to work with you know they say you shouldn't write biographies of people you don't like well you know you and i have long ago abandoned that <laughs> probably good advice but compared to osama bin laden who we both know um as writers um you know he has more dimension as just as a he's got a you know he was an autodidact he read very widely yes i mean famously he read about stalin but he also read about nelson mandela and and he read, you know, literature. He wanted to be a novelist. So he had, uh, he was, he was self-made and crude and a peasant in a lot of ways, but also, uh, you know, bright and bent on self-improvement in a funny way. Well, speaking of self-improvement, uh, everybody, please buy a copy of this book. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much, Steve, for joining us. And uh, thank you, and uh, thank you to the audience for joining us. Thank you, Peter. Always good to be with you.